Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for our second webinar as part of our hashtag Reclaim SEL webinar series on transforming social emotional learning through healing and restorative justice. Before we get started, we want to pause for some instructions for Spanish interpretation. We are so grateful to Katja and Alexia, who will lead us in Spanish interpretation and language justice. I'd like to pass it over to Katja to provide us with some important instructions. Hola, hola, buenas tardes. Um, mi nombre es Katia. Soy una de las intérpretes del inglés al español, al español al inglés esta tarde y estoy aquí con mi compañera Alexia. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. I am one of the Spanish English interpreters, and I am here today with my compañera Alexia. My name is Katia. Um, trabajamos con un marco llamado Justicia del Lenguaje, y la justicia del lenguaje incluye el compromiso de la presencia plena de todos y la capacidad de comunicarnos en nuestros idiomas. Uh, we work within a framework that's called language justice and language uh, justice includes the ability that we all have to be our full selves in our spaces and to communicate in our languages. Ahora en este espacio um, usaremos um, inglés, español y el lenguaje a de signos americana, eh, pero también quisiéramos comenzar reconociendo todos los idiomas presentes hoy aquí en este espacio y en las tierras en las que nos encontramos, eh, de, sobre todo de los pueblos indígenas de las diferentes tierras eh, que siguen en existencia y resistencia. So today in this space we have the capacity to interpret between English, Spanish and ASL. But we also want to start by recognizing all of the other languages that are uh, present here today, as well as in the lands that we inhabit, the indigenous people's lands and the origin, original um, uh, communities, and um, because they're very much still in existence and resistance. Hoy se usará ambos idiomas, el español y el inglés activamente, así que las personas que no se sienten 100% eh, cómodas en los dos idiomas eh, van a elegir un canal de idioma pronto. So both English and Spanish are going to be actively used in the space. So whoever doesn't feel 100% comfortable or is not bilingual in both languages, we're going to ask you to select a language channel in just a second. Um, estaremos usando la función de interpretación de Zoom. Eh, no está activo en este momento, no ha sido activada todavía, pero una vez que se active, lo que van a ver es lo que ahora están viendo en su pantalla. Así que si se están conectando a través de su computadora, eh, van a dar clic en el botón en forma de globito en la parte inferior de su pantalla y ahí podrán elegir su canal de idioma o inglés o español. So today we're going to be using the Zoom interpreting function to uh, interpret between English and Spanish. Uh, it hasn't been activated yet, but once it is, you will see something that uh, like the 
icons that you're seeing on the slide right now if you are joining us via a computer or a tablet or a smartphone. Um, y si se eh, reúnen, uh, si se unen a esta reunión a través de su teléfono inteligente o tableta, van a dar clic en los tres puntitos, se va a abrir otro menú, eh, interpretación de idiomas, e eh, ahí igual eh, pueden escoger su idioma preferido. And if you're joining us via a tablet or a smartphone, there will be a button with three buttons where it says more, then there's a drop down menu with language interpretation, and then you select your preferred language channel. Y finalmente, algunos recordatorios súper breves, ya que la justicia del lenguaje es responsabilidad de todos en un espacio y no solamente de los intérpretes. Um, primero, les pedimos que lleven un paso moderado al hablar para que um, podamos interpretar de la mejor forma posible. So, since language justice is everyone's responsibility, we will ask you a couple of things so you can support uh, this space. The first one is please keep a moderate pace so we can interpret all of the information to the best of our ability. Um, también um, silencien su micrófono cuando no están hablando para minimizar el ruido de fondo y escuchar bien um, a la persona que está hablando en el momento. Also, please keep your mics on a mute if you are not participating at the time so we can hear you clearly and to minimize background noise. Y finalmente, eh, si encuentran algún problema eh, con la interpretación, eh, algún problema tecnológico, por favor, siéntanse libres de comunicarse o conmigo o con Alexia, siempre la persona que no esté interpretando, o con Ellie a través del chat y les vamos a ayudar con mucho gusto. Okay, so if you have any issues with interpretation or technology, please do not hesitate to let us know, either me or Alexia, Ali or Alexis, or um, whoever is not interpreting at the time. Y eso es todo por nuestra parte. Como siempre, um, muy emocionadas y honradas de seguir apoyando el trabajo de CJSF. Y ahora sí pueden activar la interpretación. We are very happy to be here supporting this multilingual space and the conversation with CJSF and we can start the interpreting function now. Thank you. Thank you both so much. We're so grateful to be able to have you with us today. Today we are also joined by ASL interpreters, Kathy Lemons and Amanda Firth. We're so grateful to Kathy, Amanda, and Joyful Signing for being with us today. And so as you are joining in the space, we would love to check in with you. We would love to see how everyone is doing, how you're feeling today. So if you would come into the chat box and let us know your name, your pronouns, where you're tuning in from. And then our check-in question of the day is what is your heart's work? What is the work that your heart is called to do? And so as we move forward in the conversation today, please do feel free to continue to introduce yourself into the chat box. And so as we move forward and thinking about virtual space keeping, some logistics. So one, please engage with us on social media during the conversation. We are at Just Schools on Twitter and at Just Schools Fund on Instagram. For this conversation, we're using the hashtag, hashtag reclaim SEL. Please do use the chat mindfully, be aware of power and privilege, refrain from splaining. So refrain from cisplaining, heterosplaining, whitesplaining, and et cetera. Please use the chat as a space to affirm speakers, share resources, build connections, amplify what resonates, and offer your reflections. For this particular webinar, we will be using the Q&A function for tech and logistic questions. And at the end of the webinar, we'll create space for panelists to answer audience questions. And if you would please place your questions in all caps in the chat, we'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Again, we are so grateful and so excited that you are here. This series to hashtag reclaim SEL highlights the major findings from our radical report, we're calling it a rad port, that we released last October that centers organizing praxis and movement towards holistically safe schools. My name is Dr. Sierra Kaler Jones. My pronouns are she and her. I have curly brown hair and brown eyes. I'm wearing a white shirt with puppy, puffy sleeves and my favorite hot pink lipstick. My background is a white wall. 
I'm the director of storytelling for Communities for Just Schools Fund, and we're a donor collaborative that links philanthropy with the power of grassroots organizing to transform schools. We are in our 11th year. We started in 2010 by individuals in philanthropy who understood that in the ecosystem of education justice, grassroots organizers are the least resource and yet the most impactful. We have a 60 partner strong network of grassroots organizations, including youth organizers, intergenerational organizing groups, parent organizers, and teacher organizers, some of which will be joining us on the panel today and some of which I have already seen in the chat. So it's so good to be able to share this virtual space with you. Our partners come from across 22 states, Puerto Rico and Canada. We have four strategic priorities, including fund, build, connect, and lead. In entering this virtual space, I acknowledge the stolen lands from the indigenous communities of the Piscataway people. I give honor and pay respect to the lands where the knowledge and the labor that informs our collective heart work takes place. I also acknowledge and bear witness to the enslaved labor and stolen identities of our African diasporic ancestors who sacrificed their bodies across this land. Their labor and their living shall not be in vain. As we move forward in the conversation today, there have been many conversations across sectors to reimagine education amid a global pandemic, continued racial injustice, and a climate crisis. Many of these conversations center SEL, social emotional learning, as a tool for healing. However, we've seen how, ma how many well-meaning SEL initiatives, policies, and practices have been weaponized against young people, specifically Black and Brown and LGBTQ plus youth of color, as mechanisms of control and policing. The narrative has that been to exhibit or practice SEL, that young people must control and manage their emotions and in turn stifle their most authentic selves. This harmful framing is further exacerbated by the physical policing of students through harsh disciplinary practices and policies. Together, SEL, school climate, and school safety are used as means to criminalize and punish Black and Brown and LGBTQ plus youth of color, rather than create and sustain schools as spaces that are emotionally, intellectually, and physically safe. For SEL to live up to its true promise, there must be a container or an environment for SEL, meaning that school climate, safety, and SEL must be connected in intentional and holistic ways. Like Dina Simmons said, SEL alone is not enough. Nationally, we see that there is no container for SEL to happen, where there are police in schools, biometric data tracking, bills that curb the rights of transgender young people, pushes for patriotic education, schools as fortresses, and educators and administrators not being supported in their own SEL development and well-being. If states and districts are stifling critical consciousness building, spirit murdering in the words of Bettina Love, black and brown young people through whitewashed curricula and physically criminalizing young people for their existence, SEL cannot happen. Following the lead of our partners, when we say police free schools, we do not only mean getting rid of police the noun, but policing as a verb. The work to remove police from schools is to grapple with the root causes of oppression, capitalism, heteropatriarchy, and anti-Black racism, and how these then manifest in every aspect of schooling, including SEL. One of the main findings of the Radport that we'll talk about today was that culturally affirming SEL centers healing justice, emotional justice, restorative justice, and transformative justice. While equity is critical, we also push forth towards justice to transform systems. The work to reclaim SEL is not just about changing one framework, inser inserting restorative practices in co-opted ways, or putting together a curriculum. It's about changing systems built on anti-Black racism, settler colonialism, and capitalism. Our partners are creating and sustaining spaces centered in play, wholehearted listening, deep relationship building, artistic practices, 
and what Robin D.G. Kelly calls freedom dreaming. Robin Kelly also reminds us, he says, without new visions, we don't know what to build, but only what to knock down. We not only end up rudderless, confused, and cynical, but we forget that making a revolution is not a series of clever maneuvers and tactics, but a process that can and must transform us all. True SEL is about understanding our relationships with ourselves and with others, to know ourselves as holistic human beings, and to be able to see the humanity in others, to fight together, for the world we all deserve rooted in love and justice. While true transformation is a, a large feat, I trust that each of us has come here today to be in virtual community, to both dream new futures and work towards them. We're so grateful that you all are here. And so to ground us in restorative practices, I am honored to introduce Dewan and Nicole. Dewan and Nicole is the Executive Director of the Restorative Justice Partnership. She provides training and implementation support and restorative justice to all stakeholders within school communities. Prior to her work with the Restorative Justice Partnership, Dwana served as Advancements Projects Director of Policy and Stakeholder Outreach. So grateful that you are here with us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kayla Jones. I am honored to be here with all of you today to talk about um, my current work and really a passion of mine in my life's work. Um, and so I just wanna start with this idea that when we think about restorative justice and education, unfortunately, we often come to this work as the alternative to exclusionary discipline. So restorative justice in many spaces and many education spaces has simply become the thing that we do instead of suspend, expel, and arrest children. And if we think about restorative justice simply as the way to address harm, then what we are really missing is the true essence of the work. When in fact, what restorative justice is, is a philosophy that grounds us in building strong relationships. It's this idea that if I am in community with you, I am less likely to cause you harm. But when harm occurs and harm will occur, we shouldn't be afraid of conflict because we're all human. But when harm does occur, I am more likely to sit with you and work it out because I know you, because I have that foundational relationship with you. And so oftentimes schools, when they approach restorative justice as simply as we're going to use a practice when the harm has occurred, but they haven't done that foundational relationship building, it doesn't work, which is why we have unfortunately a narrative that it doesn't work. And when we explore that, what we often find is it not rooted in the essence of community building. It's the acknowledgement that there is inherent wisdom within every single member of our community. And that those most impacted by policies and practices are the ones whose voices need to be elevated. And so it is this idea that the community has all the answers. We do not need to invite others in to solve our own problems. The answers exist right here. If only we are given the opportunity to be able to work things out. And when you're trying to do this in an education space, which has historically really taken the voice away from young people, made decisions for them, punished when there was harm that occurred, this is a very new thing to do. And it is really counter to the way we were often taught in our education spaces. Because we value every single member of our school community, then we also understand that we honor them as they show up. And as that relates to SEL, what that means is that when you are happy, we welcome your happiness. When you are angry, we welcome your anger. When you are sad, you are free to express your sadness. That we're not trying to manage others' emotions, that we understand that the space can contain it all if we are doing it with fidelity. And I do definitely want to acknowledge the fact that the practices that we often use are not new. They may be new to us, but they are not new. These are practices that we are borrowing from indigenous communities across the, across the globe. And when done with fidelity, when we hold that sacredness of the space, that is where we see this beautiful work happen. Where we shift power dynamics, where we understand that our young people, our students are equal partners. It is their education after all, and we are there to support them. 
But fundamentally, what we know when we do this work well is that restorative justice is actually about how I show up as a human being. It is not about how other people are showing up. It is not about me holding anyone else accountable. It is what do I need to show up as my best self in this space so I can be my best version of myself for everyone else. And so what I wanna do right now, there are educators on this webinar, there are organizers on this webinar, many people who work um, for the betterment of our young people, specifically black and brown and other young people of color, healers, essentially healers, who oftentimes need healing. Um, before the panel gets started, what I really wanna do is offer a water blessing. When we think about one of the, um, most comprehensive restorative justice practices, we often think about sitting in circle. And when we're sitting in circle, many circle keepers bring all of the elements to their centerpiece of the circle, including water. So I'm just gonna pause for a few seconds and ask that if you have water near you, or if you can get a cup of water or a bowl of water, you know, we're really going, to, we're now going to walk you through an opportunity to really honor yourself in this space. And again, when we think about honoring yourself so you can be best for everyone else. We don't normally take time to honor our unique, amazing, creative, loving, giving, healing, growing, learning, laughing presence. That which we are unique in all of our glory. I want to tell you that you are amazing. There is no one else like you on the earth. No one. Think about that for a moment. I invite you into a moment of appreciation of yourself a moment to appreciate the unique, wonderful, and amazing human being that you are. Begin by placing your hands on your heart and softly close your eyes. As you breathe, allow yourself to become aware of your own presence. What do I mean by your presence? Your presence is every unique part of you that makes you who you are. The expression of your mind, heart, emotions, body, creativity, all of it and more make up your presence. You are a gift to this world. Remaining in this intentional space of self-appreciation Gently open your eyes and place your cup or bowl or glass of water in front of you. As you consider all the parts of yourself, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, notice what you feel appreciative about. What do you appreciate about yourself? Just notice what arises. If you place the palm of your hand over the water, take a gentle breath and offer appreciation out loud to yourself. It is important that you hear the sound of your own voice speaking the words. Next, I invite you to dip two fingers into the water and touch the center of your forehead honoring the brilliance and creativity of your mind. Breathe it in. Now, dip your fingers into the water again and touch your lips, honoring the wisdom of wise communication you share with others. Breathe it in. Dip your fingers into the water again 
and touch your heart. Honoring your unique expression of emotion, how you give and receive love and caring. Breathe it in. Now take the time to honor any other part of yourself that you feel called to honor. Will you, when you feel complete, make sure you breathe in love and compassion for yourself. Bring your awareness back to the group as you open your eyes and place your hands on your heart center. So this work, we often think about the young people and how we want the young people to show up. But again, what this really is about is how are we showing up? What are our own practices that we must transform? What are the things that we do that we must acknowledge and stop? The only person we can hold accountable is ourself. And so when we're thinking about restorative justice in education spaces, it is beginning with that this work actually starts with me. That this requires that I adopt a philosophy, a set of beliefs and values where I really honor the uniqueness of every single member of our school community for all that they are. Thank you. Ooh, wow. Tawana, thank you so, so much for leading us through that blessing. It, it truly was a blessing and I feel honored to have experienced that. Thank you for sharing your gifts and your talents with all of us. And leaning further into the space that Dwana has facilitated for us, we'll dream forward using our unique gifts, talents, and strengths that we've tapped into to create using the brilliance and creativity of our minds. And so one of my colleagues will drop a link to a Padlet in the chat. And we invite you to head into this Padlet. And once you're in the Padlet, we would invite you to one, imagine, draw, or create your dream school, workplace, or world. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does this consist of? What does it not consist of? What did it take to get to this dream world, school, or workplace? What do we want to build? And so you'll see the Padlet link either in the chat box or if you like to use technology, there is a QR code on the screen. And all you have to do is take your phone, come to the camera setting on your phone, open it, and then press it up to the computer screen like so, and you'll be able to access the Padlet if you're accessing it on your phone. And my colleagues will also place the instructions in the chat box. But just to review, we invite you to imagine, draw or create your dream school, workplace or world. You can create on a piece of paper and then upload your drawing to the collaborative art board as we'll call it, or you can create directly on the Padlet. To create in the Padlet, you would just click on the plus button at the bottom right hand corner of the screen. And when the box comes up to type your reflections, you can click on the three dots next to the camera icon at the bottom of the text box. From there, you can click on drawing. 
So one, imagine, draw, create, and you can create directly in the Padlet. Two, we would invite you to type your reflections in the chat box. And then if you have time after writing your reflection, we invite you to read others' reflections or check out everyone's artwork on the collaborative art board. You'll have access to this Padlet after this webinar. It will stay live so you can come back and iterate on your work at any time. We'll take about five minutes here to continue on in sacred pause and sacred breath so that we can dream and collectively create together on the Padlet. If you have any challenges, please feel free to just let us know in the chat box. We'll pause here for five minutes and then we'll move into our very exciting panel conversation and discussion. Can't wait to see your artwork.
Thank you all so much for your contributions to the Padlet. I am so excited to see everything that you have created and everything that you've written. Please do know that you'll have access to the Padlet link. It'll continue to be live. So you'll have an opportunity to continue to comment on one another's creations and writings. And then also you have an opportunity to continue to create and put more photos and your artwork on here. I see some really beautiful community gardens. I see Ubuntu, I am because we are. I see lots of hearts, interconnectedness, weaving, trees, growth. I also see no police presence. I see fresh fruit, green, comprehensive health education. So many powerful things that we are all creating here together. And with that, I'm excited to begin our panel conversation. I'll introduce each of the panelists as they come into our virtual space. We're hoping that it'll be like we're sitting around one another at a table in conversation and we'll get started. So first I would like to introduce Wakumi Douglas is the co-founder of the Miami and New York City based Soul Sisters Leadership Collective. She is currently a Soros Advocacy Fellow. She previously was the clinical supervisor for the Alternative to Incarceration Program for Youth at the Center for Community Alternatives in Brooklyn, New York, and has worked as a restorative justice circle keeper, social worker, community organizer, trainer, and popular educator. Wakumi, I'm so, so grateful that you could be in conversation with us today. It's great to be here. Thanks for having invited me. Thank you. Next, I'm excited to welcome to the space Jenny Arwade is the co-executive director of Chicago-based Communities United, a survivor-led intergenerational organization working to advance a community-led vision for healing-centered schools and communities. Communities United is a convener of Voices of Youth in Chicago Education, Voice. Jenny, I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you. Next, I'd like to invite Nayoka Acevedo to the space. Nayoka is a program officer for the Andrus Family Fund. She helps manage Andrus's $4 million, $4 million national portfolio of more than 50 grantee partners. Nayoka brings more than 15 years of experience in the field of program development, management, grant making, and education, all in service of creating social change and advancing outcomes for our nation's most vulnerable youth and communities. She has also trained hundreds of educators in New York and Los Angeles on restorative practices through a healing justice framework. Nayoka, so glad that you're here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I would also like to invite into the space Talia Gonzalez, a professor, uh, and I'm hearing that Talia uh, was promoted to full professor last month, so many celebrations and much congratulations. Uh, professor at Occidental College and senior scholar at Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality. At Georgetown Law, she leads national research on restorative justice outcomes, implementation, practice, and policy. She is a nationally recognized expert in the field of restorative justice, whose cross-disciplinary work focuses on civil and human rights, the school to prison pipeline, race, gender and inequality, and juvenile justice. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. This is a wonderful space to be in. Woo. I am so excited for this panel. Now that you've had an opportunity to be introduced to all of the panelists, you can also probably feel the same level of excitement for all of the beautiful expertise that is in this virtual space. And for those that are attending the webinar, please do feel free to add your comments and your reflections in the chat box as we want this to be as conversational as possible. So let's jump into it. We'll do our first question for the full group of panelists. And I would love to hear from you all after that beautiful grounding from Duana and the art wall collaborative reflections. I would love to hear some of your reflections. So what do healing and restorative justice look and feel like in your work and in your life? Whoever would like to take it first. I can start. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with all of you. And 
Um, thank you, Sierra, and also Duana. That was a beautiful blessing um, to start us off in community together. Um, I would say that um, that you know, as a survivor, an organizer, a mother, a daughter, a friend, um, a partner, um, that the work of healing and restorative justice it's deeply personal, um, and I would say that. It feels like a gentle breeze oftentimes um, that it's really built into um, you know, an intentionality and a daily practice um, of love and commitment. Um, and that um, you know, oftentimes it, it goes unnoticed, oftentimes it's very noticeable and um, it's really focused around that gentle pause for reflection um, that's needed no matter what the situation. Um, and so it shows up um, in my life and work in many ways um, that I know we'll talk more about, but I'll offer that to kick us off. I can share next. Um, again, it's great to be here. I am joining everyone from Miccosukee, Tequesta, and Seminole lands in what we now call Miami on this really special day. Today is the National Day of Awareness around missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and two-spirit folks. And so um, just a really special day to be in conversation with all of you about restorative justice, um, which is a gift as we learn from indigenous people, um, as well as healing. Um, and so just honored to be here with everyone. Um, I think for me uh, and like what healing looks like to me is very uh, front of mind for me and, and what's happening in my life right now. I'm in a lot of change and transition um, professionally and personally in my life right now. And um, I think what healing looks like and feels like to me has a lot to do with just radical acceptance of being in deep acceptance of where I am, as I am in every moment um, and uh, seeking to apply the same love and kindness to myself that I apply to others. Um, I think for me as a dark skinned black woman in a white supremacist <laughs> patriarchal world, um, the self attack um, is very real. And so being learning, learning, learning constantly um, how to center care for myself um, and how to receive care um, and how to understand that uh, receiving care doesn't make me a burden to others. So that's, that's my own personal healing walk. Um, I think in, in my work and in our work at Soul Sisters, um, healing and restorative justice has really been um, looking like creating free zones and free spaces, self-determined and, and group determined spaces for girls and non-binary youth in um, school settings where push out is an issue as, as well as confinement settings. Um, it's looked like having our eye on the prize in terms of ending girls incarceration and using restorative justice as a tool for that. Um, which is work that we're doing in Miami-Dade County, uh, where the numbers of girls who are being arrested is quite small. And quite frankly, we don't need the state to respond uh, to the issues that, the, that, that are leading to arrest. We know that we can hold it in community and use restorative and transformative justice interventions to end girls' incarceration altogether. So that's a part of what our work looks like, talking about a big dream. That's our big dream. Um, doesn't actually feel like that big of a dream. We could do it. Um, and I think it's about creating, for me as a executive director, it's about creating organizational cultures that are rooted in care um, and balance for directly impacted survivor leaders within our organization to have room to do system change and to do youth, youth leadership work, but also to create room and opportunities for healing. And lastly, I think my work has also been about or a part of my work has been getting to partner with really, really awesome funders. Um, and I always wanna uplift the funders that are doing right <laughs> out here in this funding landscape um, for nonprofits. Funders like Communities for Just Schools Fund, like Third Wave Fund, like Andrus Family Fund, like Grant Makers for Girls of Color, like Collective Futures Fund, who are thinking about how to do funding in ways that support and promote sustainability and healing. And I've gotten to get to know a lot of folks who are a part of that work and, um, I'm really proud to be partnered um, with those folks. So I'll move back. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Sierra, for facilitating a beautiful space. Um, thank you, Dijuana, for the beautiful opening. Um, I'll, you know, if, if someone asked me this question pre-COVID, I'd probably have a different answer. I think healing and restorative justice in this, in this particular cycle feels like grief and grace. Um, it feels very messy. It feels, um, it feels like all, it feels like what I tell my kid, you know, it feels like all the feels at any given moment. Um, and like Wakumi said, um, extending ourselves and our loved ones and our communities, the grace to feel all the feels um, during this really like unprecedented time. Um, what does healing and restorative justice look like in philanthropy is such an interesting question. Um, I think <laughs> I just have to chuckle. You know, I often feel like, um, you know, our role is like to mitigate the harm. If I'm, if, if I'm going to be honest, like our role is to like find your folks in philanthropy who have values of line. Um, I want to shout out the, uh, the, the head of our board. I saw CC Glesser in the chat. Um, you know, it's like find your people who have values of line, find your community, find your tribe. Um, and, and really figure out like or how we're gonna move in this values aligned way that really mitigates the harm of philanthropy um, because we are essentially stepping into a legacy of harm as people who come from community, as people of color, you know, and it's a very, um, it's, a, it's a hard, it's a, you know, it's a hard, it's a hard line to walk, um, but we do have a, we have a responsibility, right? And so just, just holding that. And so that's 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 what I'm feeling, and that's what I'm holding these days. Thank you. Well, I have to say, there's is there really anything else to add at this stage, right? I mean, I think we've we've captured now some really amazing moments that are also, I think, going to get texted and retexted, and probably like placed um, in just significant ways that it reminds us about our dignity, our humanity, our respect that we have both internally and externally, what it means to move in the world. Um, so maybe I'll think about it from the perspective of asking sort of what does it mean in academia, right? To sort of pick up on that point of what does it mean? What does it look like in philanthropy? What does it look like in academia? Um, you know, my so much of my work is about re-narrating the traditional ways in which we have just absolutely lost the connection um, to what uh, what the foundation is of restorative justice, and even to the fact that we shouldn't attach the word justice to the word restorative, because in many ways, um, it's not ever going to be justice. And there are many people in this world that will never experience a form of justice. And so that in, it, sometimes it's often just that makes us feel better, um, especially as academics and as policymakers, uh, to have something that we name that feels uh, not like the system, even though it is the system. So, you know, I think especially when it comes to the perspective of healing justice, is to also use the power and privilege of being in academia to put that empirical work behind it. So that even that we know in our heart of hearts that it's about healing, even that we know in our heart of hearts, it is about how do we navigate with all of the identities that we carry with us, uh, not only ourselves, but ancestral identities as we move in this world. Um, that what's the power of that? So, you know, what is it to say, yes, and restorative practices, right? These relational moments are healing justice, but now here's data behind it. Um, so that for those folks that need that, right? The, maybe those funders that need that, maybe those policymakers that need that, maybe, you know, the system engaged people so you can tell them to get out of the way, most importantly, sort of have a place that they can um, situate themselves. And so, you know, I, that's where I see so much of what it is to reimagine and renegotiate um, and really push the boundaries so that it still is imbued with the life force of what it means to think restoratively and live restoratively, but to have that sort of moment where you can put it into a set of terms and parameters and ways um, that will push the movement forward um, and being really mindful of that element of power and privilege in that context. Mm, wow, thank you all so much for 
for sharing what that what that feels like, what that looks like in your life and in your work. And, and I'm hearing a couple of themes already beginning to surface. One, this duality of being able to hold different emotions and, and allowing ourselves to feel and experience them. And I know that that's something that Dewana had talked about as well, is like showing up in our righteous rage, showing up in our grief, but also showing up in our joy, uh, showing up in our creativity, showing up in our brilliance. I'm also hearing the importance of leaning on community and really getting to the heart of connection, of deep relationship building. And I'm also hearing how we must move into a place where restorative justice, transformative justice, SEL has to be at the root of our organizational culture. So one thing that I've learned from Wakumi and Soul Sisters Leadership Collective is they have the personalities and principles, which is their way of being in their organization, which is a form of SEL, their commitments to one another, like Jenny was talking about the daily practice and the daily commitment to doing this work with ourselves and with one another. And so as we think about, as Talia said, reimagining and renegotiating, how do we even do that within, within first ourselves and then within our organizations, specifically in this capitalist society that capitalizes off of this hustle and grind culture. And so, for all of the panelists, I would love to hear you all talk about what do you see as the potential for social emotional learning to transform schools to be centered in healing and restorative justice? And then also, what are the challenges? Well, I can just share. Um, I think I had a a session with my spiritual mentor last week where we were talking about how, and I feel like I heard some of this in what you were sharing, Talia, um, how healing isn't just about a set of activities. It's not like just about like a set of things that we're doing, but it's about a way that we're being with each other. It's about like our isness. And I, and I know that can sound kind of like, that might sound a little, esoteric or it might sound a little like hard to distant but as a concept but it's not about a set of activities it's not about a checklist <laughs> it's about how we are um in our way with each other and i hope for people who are listening that doesn't sound um uh vague and so when jenny is talking about the practice um i think that that's the thing that feels so critical um and that the work and what Soul Sisters is learning in our implementation of restorative justice in, in confinement settings is it's got so much to do with the people, the staff, the adults. It has a, like a lot to do um, success in terms of restorative practices and incorporating healing justice at a systemic level within agencies and schools has a lot to do with staff training, staff coaching, staff feeling like they have spaces to vent and share how they feel around the secondary trauma and vicarious traumatization that they're experiencing. What we're learning is if we want these institutions to be able to hold the young people well, um, two options, get rid of them, start from scratch, or like be prepared to do really, really deep work with the adults who are responsible for the young people's care um, and well-being. Um, to support them in that being, in that isness, in learning how to be with the young people differently. Um, and so that's that's the thought that I have. I think the last thing that I would say is that we've been really, really inspired by um, Communities for Just Schools Fund facilitating and pushing the envelope on social emotional learning. We've been learning a lot about uh, culturally affirming SEL and have thought about some principles around that for us that we're holding, which are about supporting young people in self-advocacy, increasing their sense of self-worth, supporting them in radical vulnerability and empathy. This past summer, um, radical vulnerability, the young people were like deeply connected to what that means for them and their ability to heal. Um, create, supporting young people in learning creative and compassionate communication, uh, supporting them in positive relationships with self, land, and community, um, and in, and being able to make do self-determined decision-making, um, where they're thinking about what are decisions that are going to um, support me and my ultimate benefit. So those are some of the thoughts that, um, that come to mind for me. 
I'd love to add to that. So um, I would say our muchness, right? To take from Alice in Wonderland, um, when Alice loses her muchness and she has to find it again and sort of be in self, but self means in relationship with others. It's that idea, right? Like what is our, our muchness and how do we both claim that, um, but also share that simultaneously and not give too much away, <laughs> um, which I think can very much be a challenge in this work. So thinking to the challenge question, right? From a structural standpoint, when you're looking at investing in creating the scaffolding by which restorative practices as practice, not necessarily as philosophy, but as a set of like actual practices exist within a school setting, what do those look like? And how do you ensure that there's not practitioner burnout? How do you share power between young people and adults, right? The traditional model is an adult led and in a lot of instances actually outside practitioner led, though that's shifting in schools in some ways, but it's not youth led, right? It's not developed internally to the point of, we know though that the capacities that come from leading this work, right? And being able to share this work um, should not be isolated based on an arbitrary date that we set um, for someone age as them being sort of, you know, fully realized um, as what this is. And so, you know, I think for, there's these just these really pragmatic ways of like, how does that show up? Um, I think part of that is also driven by the fact that we don't nest restorative practices, restorative justice, healing justice in and about social uh, SEL, right? We still have these arbitrary silos in which we separate them. We study them. We have outcomes for them. We measure them. We have metrics about them. And then we want to come back and be like, ah, yes, but we fold them together, right? Um, and I think that does an incredible disservice. I think that when we don't operate from an ecosystem framework, whether it be about schools, whether it be what happens in our home, whether it's in our community, right? The sort of the totality of the relationality, which is the central um, element of what restorative practices are, we lose something. Right. And so, you know, I think about the work that we just did over the last two years sitting in focus groups, which really actually were like sitting in circle um, with young women of color across the country, talking with them about their experiences. Sure, we could categorize an outcome as social emotional learning, but it was it, as one of our six outcomes, but we still had to think about it as it related to resilience. We had to think about it as it related to mental health. We had to think about you know, what it meant for overall well-being and their connections to others. And, um, and I think that is both the benefit and the burden in that the potential to transform is to operate from a much more ecosystem framework where we see all of those wonderful webs coming together and reverberating against each other but then simultaneously not trying to always separate them out. And, and I will say, unfortunately, I think other funders do want them disaggregated. They really want those unique and distinct metrics, which can be very challenging um, for folks on the ground doing the work. And also for those of us that are looking to advance it right within the field as well. So, you know, I think it's coming back to how do we, within the context of the movement broadly, think about building bridges filling these gaps and really seeing the possibility so that we're we're living restoratively and our work then is restorative as well. And I think I'd add on to what Wakumi and Talia said um, that, you know, starting with the challenges and kind of the dangers that SEL is not a program right, to be impl implemented upon people. And I think that that is how we oftentimes see this playing out um, within our school systems and, you know, other systems that um, black and brown young people and their families are many times subjected to, right, rather than being holistically a part of creating. And so the exciting opportunity that I see when we think about SEL as a process, right, a powerful process rooted in the wisdom of families and communities, right, who have been impacted by generations of harm, um, is that the wisdom, right, what we see in community organizing is that the folks who are the black and brown youth, right, who are most shut out of systems, right, who end up, you know, having contact with policing, with the justice system, with deportation, um, 
they shine in community settings, right? Where their identities, their lived experiences are valued and their leadership flourishes. And so the potential of SEL is to take that and harness that in partnership with educators, right? In partnership with folks in our schools to really look holistically at how we break down that really artificial wall, right? That exists between our schools and communities um, and build um, holistically together. Yeah, I want to plus one everything everyone has said. I mean, just so, so on point. Um, I don't have much to add, except perhaps one of the challenges is that, um, you know, there has to be an acknowledgement that schools are often sites of intergenerational trauma, right? And so when I worked in LA at Gompers Middle School, you know, we we had we trained teachers, we had the teachers on board, you know, we trained leadership, we had leadership on board, we trained young people, we had young people on board. And you know, and then you would have parents come in who also attended Gompers Middle School and and, and experienced real harm in, in this particular building, not just in educational settings, right? But think about the trigger that one, you know, that one experiences when they walk into a building. And the flood of emotions that comes back when you think about that teacher, when you think about that interaction, when you think about that harm as you're coming to discuss your child, right? And so I think it's, it's critical for us to acknowledge that and, and fold parents and community into the ecosystem, much like Jenny, Thalia, and Wakumi have said, right? Like if schools are porous in, the, in that whatever's happening in the community happens in schools, it also happens the opposite way. And so thinking about how that, um, how the transfer of learning happens and how we fold in more than just young folks, more than just leadership, more than just teachers um, into this learning and really this, um, you know, like a shift, essentially like a shift in culture and acknowledging the wisdom that folks already have. So lifting up, you know, Jenny's point. Mm, thank you all so much. Just thinking about acknowledging the harms of, of systems and how those harms show up every day. And then also thinking about what you said, Jenny, is SEL's quote unquote programs, right? Something that's done to people rather than it being something that we do and something that we are and the way that we communicate with each other, the way that we understand ourselves. And as I've learned from our partners, it's not just about relationship with self or relationship with others, but relationship with land that has historically been stolen from communities. We learned that from Southwest Organizing Project in Albuquerque, New Mexico, relationship with ancestors, relationship with joy and creativity. And so not viewing SEL as a checklist, that was one of the findings that came out of, of the rap board, that it's not a checklist, it's not an ad on, but rather has to be embedded in every aspect of all that we are and all that we do. And so as we think about some of the challenges, Wakumi, I'm going to turn to you because I know that organizers across the country continue to fight for police-free schools and have been winning. Many school districts are replacing police officers or school resource officers with social workers. I know that there are a number of counselors, social workers on the call, and we know that social work as a profession has a long and troubled history of operating as agents of the carceral state. So what do you think are the possibilities of abolitionist social work and what are some of the pitfalls? Yeah, that's such a good question. I was on a panel about this a couple months ago. Um, and I think it's a hard question. I, first, I just want to acknowledge that abolitionist social work is a phrase that is new. So it's something that folks are just coming to identify as and organize around. I want to acknowledge that there are people who, there are folks who would say there's no such thing as abolitionist social work um, because of things like social workers uh, mandated reporting requirements and such because of social workers complicity um, as you named in systems um, in the legal system in particular um, and i think there is an exciting opportunity for social workers to see themselves as folks who are in a radical tradition um, black social work in particular 
has a history of being in a radical social work tradition. One that is in, there's a beautiful book by a sister Patricia, Patricia Reed Merritt called Radical Self-Determination. I strongly recommend it for anyone who's a social worker, um, particularly a person who identifies as black and is a social worker who's listening, um, where she tells the history of uh, one, of course, the exclusion of black social workers from the National Association of Social Workers. She tells the history of black folks identifying other black folks as social workers without the degrees. I think a part of the problem with social work is the professionalization, that there are people, our aunties, our neighbors, um, our coaches, our teachers, our, our counselors, the church lady, the candy lady, the, all these people. I, I'm thinking mostly about women, which is interesting pretty gendered, but there are, are people um, of all genders who offer healing, support, mediation, restorative practices, et cetera, in our communities that are not going to have access to what it takes to get an MSW. Um, and so the Black social work tradition says, yes, those are social workers. Um, and so I think as we are unfolding this concept of what abolitionist social work looks like, we should absolutely be following the lead um, of Black women as we should always be doing. Um, and, uh, and I think if folks are seeking to be abolitionists in their social work practice, what folks have to be doing is exactly what Nyoka named is identifying where are the harms of the field um, and what are some things that I can do as a practitioner to undo those harms, which may mean being courageous. It may mean being less concerned or less invested about our jobs and our titles um, and perhaps putting that on the line. Sometimes we have to put that on the line to do what's right um, on behalf of our people. Um, and it means to really be thoughtful and mindful of what the structures are in which we're operating and how we are actively and in a daily practice of, uh, in, un, of undoing those structures. Um, so that's what comes up. I think it's, it's a concept that I'm still grappling with. Um, and I think many of us are. Thank you, Alkumi. And I and I just appreciate like that that SEL in motion, right? Of that we are we are all works in progress and, and we do this work collectively. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to learn from you, particularly in this area and all the great work that you've been doing in, in healing justice. And so I'm gonna to turn to Jenny now. Uh, and I've learned so much from you all at Communities United and you all provide a really beautiful and powerful framework to build a broader consciousness of what healing can look like. So can you share with us uh, about the Healing Through Justice framework and also more about the, the WOKE project? What suggestions do you have for schools to engage deeply with community through healing centered approaches? Sure, thanks. Um, so our healing through justice approach is really a journey of 20 years of work in organizing and building community. Um, and again, as a survivor led organization, um, I think over the years, um, we really come to reflect upon kind of the public pain and private pain that we bear um, as individuals um, in our lives and our work. And um, uh, our approach to healing and organizing, um, it really emerged out of the narratives, right, of our folks um, over and over. We were hearing from young folks ourselves, right, elders in our communities that, um, that not only has this work been healing, but it's actually been life-saving, right, in so many different ways. And so we really went about asking the question of what is it about what we do that we find so deeply healing, right? And so the things that really stood out through the narratives, right? Um, again, of ourselves and our members and our communities was really, um, you know, building our own sense of loving identity, right? For ourselves, our collective identity with, with each other you know, taking oftentimes the shame that we feel from trauma that we've experienced, right? And being able to transform that into a deeper understanding of actually the causes and systems of oppression, right? That create these conditions. And um, like we've talked about building that really authentic relational culture with each other's right and community. And lastly, I'd say it's that sense of purpose we get, right? Being able to take pain that we've experienced and actually change them, right? Take the harm 
and be able to turn it into justice for others, right? We may not be able to change what's happened to us, but we can change, right? Um, the future of what's um, unfolding before us for others. So that's um, really how we think about um, kind of the power of healing through justice. And then the work that we've done has been to, through the Woke Project, um, working on knowledge and equity, which was named by our young people. We really went through a journey in partnership with schools in our local communities, you know, as we've been working around removal of police of school in schools, of course, um, to really imagine and co-create um, with educators from five schools um, that we work with, how we take this approach to healing through justice and how do we translate it to a school setting, right? So that um, young people aren't just involved in, you know, youth voice, right? On certain aspects of school programming, but are actually um, deep, deeply embedded as leaders um, in actually developing the teaching and learning that unfolds in their schools. Um, so there's lots to say about it, but I know we have limited time. So that's a brief <laughs> overview. That was wonderful. Thank you. And I just appreciate everything that I'm lear I've learned from you all, because one of the findings that also came out of the Radport was that organizing is SEL. That's what it looks like in motion, the deep relationship building necessary to build a base, uh, as you talked about knowing ourselves deeply so that we can then have relationship with others and then having relationship with others to then develop campaigns and figure out what are the social issues in the world that we want to change, that we want to transform, and how beautifully powerful organizing shows us what this looks like and what this feels like in motion. So really grateful for you and all that we've been able to learn from you all. Next, I'm going to turn over to Nayoka uh, because I would love to hear from you more about the funder and philanthropy perspective, but also embedding and weaving in the really powerful experiences that you've had in training hundreds of educators through a racial justice framework and bridging those aspects of, of your unique gifts together. And so how can philanthropies lean into trust-based philanthropy that's really about following the lead of community rather than overshaping the work of, of organizers, the work of organizations and approaches to that work? What does it look like in practice to truly center community in philanthropy? Thank you for that question. Um, I think first I'll say that I've learned so much from CJSF in terms of actualizing what this looks like, right? So this looks like, you know, trust-based philanthrop philanthropic practices. It looks like general operating funds. It looks like following the lead of community. Um, and I think on the, and it also, this is, I'm gonna be really honest and vulnerable with y'all because I feel like this is a growth area for me. Um, you know, as someone who works in philanthropy, you know, we hold the tension of like having to translate the work to the folks who actually release the funds, right? So we're kind of like, um, you know, like my, our role is to, to move the money, right? Um, and so I think we also, and I'm learning um, how to be like, how to be more like, yes, follow the lead of community. Absolutely. And when, when we need more information to be thoughtful in how we frame questioning so that it's not like an interrogation, which it can sometimes feel like, which sometimes I'm asking questions and I'm like, damn, that sounds like I'm like questioning them or interrogating them. But really the thing I want, I just want more information so that I can take it and translate it and get the thing approved so we can move the money, you know? And so I think for me, that's like a fine, it's like a fine tension point that I'm like, I'm sitting with um, because it's about like, how, how, how are we living into our values? You know, so I think there are, there are the general practices of yes, move the money, follow movement. But then, you know, if we're taking this like RJ healing lens, you know, we have to constantly be like conducting the internal audit of how are we living our values and how are we responding to the tension? So I think that's ongoing work. Um, and for those, those on the webinar who are in philanthropy, like I would also like challenge you all who are listening in to really think about that. Like, how are we, how are we living out our values and how are we actualizing them in, in our communication with other folks as we're doing the work of translation and holding that tension? Um, and I'll, I'll end it there. 
Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. And I appreciate just the acknowledgement of, of this is a, a work in progress and continues to be because I know one of one of the things that came up in, in the RAD port is asking all of ourselves questions around why do we feel the need to control? Because we live in such a policing society, right? So as we're talking about transformative work and transforming schools, and also thinking about transforming society. And so what you said about in asking for more information and being really thoughtful and really intentional, I know in philanthropy, that need to control can sometimes come up. And so what does it mean to really ask those thoughtful ask those questions in really thoughtful ways. Uh, and the question that you asked about like, how are we living our values every single day? I really appreciate that. Thank you. And also grateful that I get to learn alongside you. And I'll now look to uh, Talia. So you and your colleagues are coming out with a new report, I think, what, in a couple of weeks, which is very exciting. May 11th, actually. Oh, oh my it's, gosh. I know, it's right around the corner. <laughs> Yes. And from our conversations, I've learned that the report centers girls of colors, voices and restorative practices, and that one of the six outcomes detailed in the report is SEL. So can you tell us a little bit more about what you and your colleagues found in your research and particularly what does an asset based approach to restorative practices that centers in intersectionality? What can that look like? I'll sort of save the answer to the last question in that in some ways I'll invite people to read the report because it's actually rich with the voices um, of, of all the young women that were so generous with their time to participate. Um, and that actually is, is thinking about your first question, but also a little bit of a pivot in how I wanna answer it. Um, why do we do this work? Uh, and I think it's important to think about that. And there's a couple of reasons. Um, one, the even the words evidence-based practices, which is what we rely on both in the context of the academic community, but even in philanthropy, is an incredibly exclusive and marginalizing um, way to police knowledge and also to police uh, the expertise and wisdom. So, so evidence-based practices are so often not defined by qualitative work, meaning that they aren't about the lived experiences and the voices of those that are most impacted. And so we were really intentional um, in pushing back on our funder to say, we will not have a research design, design that is not inclusive um, of, an, of a deep and rich and qualitative element. And that also meant to think about when we were asking this question about how do restorative practices have an association with public health and health outcomes, a deeply underexplored area in the field um, was then to also say, um, there's an incredible gender bias, both in education research and in public health research. Um, within the restorative justice field, there are four studies um, exclusively about girls of color. And that's it, right? Um, that's deeply problematic. Um, and it reinforces, again, a, a narrative, too, that is also about a de deficit-based approach, right? Because even in those studies, it's about what is it to fix behaviors? And that is, as Dwan said, that association with discipline, right? So it's an association with the state. It's an association with discipline. It's, it's not an asset best framework. We're not asking the question of what do young people bring to the table? What are they experiencing? And how does that then transform their lives and their communities for the better? We're saying, what's wrong with you? And how do we fix that, right? And restorative justice has fallen into that trap. And so we were really looking to intervene in all of those conversations. One, on the gender bias side in research. Two, in really acknowledging that restorative practices in schools, but in other sites, but in schools in particular, are about public health. So whether it's the restorative justice laws that sit at the state level to the practices on the ground, those are actually either, they can be things that either mitigate risks for future health, negative health outcomes, or can ultimately perpetuate future health outcomes. Um, and so we need to be really clear that they are not just an educational civil rights or a social justice issue. While all that's critical, it's more than that. Um, and then also to, again, center the voices from a research design on those that are 
like historically and contemporaneously left out of the conversation. Um, and so we spent two years doing that work, um, traveling all over the country in a time when we can still travel, which feels remarkably long ago, um, and sitting and having those conversations. And what, what we were able to then find, to, to put it in those more academic terms, is that the use of non-disciplinary, right? So this was not because a student was being referred forced, however you want to think about it. Um, it was not associated with anything was disciplined, but in a proactive stance, um, there were restorative practices, circle practices, and uh, those were associated with positive health outcomes. One of those being social emotional learning as a big bucket, right, which is a protective health factor, another being school connectedness, another being positive school climate, another being peer connectedness, um, familial connectedness, and then also to mental health and resilience. And so it was to really think about what is the totality of when these practices exist in schools. Um, and then they're also done in spaces where it's all just students who identify as female um, and that there's a unique dynamic uh, about what that spaces and how that space influences the possibility for that those relationships to build and to e expand um, and that was something that sort of then came out within the context of this work and so it, it's it's really exciting um, you know because it's now part of a toolkit in that someone can pick up this report our early issue brief from 19 two fact sheets and use them in whatever way advances their work and it's all free Right, like you don't have to have a subscription. You don't need to go down try to figure out how to get that peer reviewed paper. Right, like it's all there, um, and it's it which should then be used in whatever way you want to leverage it in your work. Um, and that's really the point is to is to make sure that academia is not perpetuating that privileging, is not continuing to re-narrate and narrate that subordination, that siloing, um, and all of what those elements look like. So um, I'm super excited. I mean, it's it's been a labor of love and um, you know, it really is that moment where we can start to just again to that point reimagine what are the possibilities um, and i'm just excited about who will pick this up next uh, i don't own it i should never own it it's you know and and so where i can also sort of provoke the next level um that next you know that next thought um very very exciting for me thank you so much i know we're so excited for the report to come out i see in the chat box that many other folks are also very excited for the report to come out and I really appreciate what, what you said around evidence-based practices. I know at CJSF and with our, our network of partners and, and donor members, we've been thinking a lot about the intersections of storytelling. Like how do we tell the stories of, these work, of this work? And then how do we also muss up this idea of what is evidence and what is not? People's lived experience is evidence. Right, and so why do we only privilege certain quote unquote evidence over others? Uh, and what you, everything that you've shared with me is just, or shared with us is really just further illuminating the, the power and the possibilities of what happens when we all work collectively to, to do this work to transform. And so as we go into our final question together, would love to hear maybe just one, one or two lines of a closing thought from each of the panelists, really thinking about our dreaming questions of what needs to exist for holistic safety, what needs to be dismantled, and what does it mean to truly transform schools to be safe spaces? So a closing thought around around the dreams, but also what needs to happen to get to that dream world, that dream school, that dream workplace. Um, so I, I'll answer really pragmatically. So one is the environment to be holistically safe. It needs to be radically transparent and holistically safe for whoever feels the most marginalized and that's not about a question of sort of weighing everyone's like levels of oppression it's being it's recognizing that when those that are most marginalized aren't free then we are all not free right and i, I really look to the lead of black women um, and black feminists in framing that and understanding that and continuing to promote that right from a collective standpoint but then too what needs to be dismantled at a very pragmatic level we should not have exclusionary school discipline laws still on the books in our states um, that perpetuate a rampant structural 
subordination and discrimination. Um, and that where we have restorative justice laws, they should not be relegated to two or three single lines without actually any teeth and power behind them. So this is also me putting my hat on as a lawyer, right? Like we just have not done a good job and we certainly haven't covered all 50 states. Um, and so I think I'll leave the, the third question for, for my colleagues on this panel, but I think there's some really central ways in which we need to, to start to operate. And then also just, again, recognize that within the context of privilege, we can't all be free um, until everyone is free. And in particular, right, I think for students that sit in these really complex spaces um, of intersectional identities, they should be at the forefront of all of the work that we do. And I'd, um, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And I'd just add that, um, you know, as we keep in mind, um, you know, in terms of the conversation about evidence-based, right, that as we we're reimagining our future, right, um, it takes time to dismantle these systems, right, that have caused so much harm. And so, for example, in Chicago, our schools reopened this spring for the first time in 30 years without SROs present, right? But there's so much work ahead um, as we work to really make sure that it is, again, it's police, police but policing, right? Um, and that we really work to sustain this over the long haul and that in order to really transform our schools to be holistically safe and supportive and inclusive and loving places, right? that we really have to lean on the foundation that teaching and learning is not one directional, right? That um, it's multi-directional and that we bring our collective wisdom, right? We center our communities. Um, and then I believe there's so much power for transformation ahead of us. All right, now yoga, I'll go next. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, you know, at Soul Sisters, we operate from the idea that Talia mentioned and also from the idea that particularly our most marginalized people have led social change movements, they've led in critical social and scientific innovations you know our people are girls and non-binary youth and and you know as they age women and adults um, are really critical for the fabric of our society and so for us what it means to truly transform schools into safe places is that we actually get the world gets to actually benefit from all that our young people have to offer um, and we're missing out on a lot. And I think to your point, Talia, about the assets-based approach is our young people have so many powerful, incredible offerings. Um, if we would create room and space for them to offer them. And um, that's that to me is what it means. Now you have to go, Nayoka. <laughs> I don't have much to add. I mean, you all really just, you know, brought it home. I, you know, like, yeah, sense of absolutely, we must censor those mismarginalized. We have to put, you know, we have to put teeth into those policies, right? Um, whether they be at the school level, district level, you know, or city and state level. And, um, and, and, and kind of building on what you were saying, Wakumi, like, you know, every person in that school building is, is an expert. They are an expert of themselves. And they are carrying, and that is information, right? And so that learning is both ways. And so until we start to value folks as everyone in the building as an expert of their experience, you know, that, that for me, that's what it's gonna take to have a have safe, transformative, uh, loving, restorative schools. Everyone has value for what, you know, to what they bring. Oh, wow. I, oh gosh, I'm so honored to be able to be in conversation with all of you. So first and foremost, thank you. Thank you for being here in this virtual space. Thank you for the 
powerful and incredible work that you move every day in your lives and in your community and in your work. And so as we get ready to close, I just want to pull together some of the, the major points that I'm hearing and that as Jenny said, teaching and learning is not one directional, that SEL is also not one directional, it's multi-dimensional. And we must center communities, uh, as Wakumi talked about, radical self-determination of, of communities hold so much expertise and knowledge and power. And so tapping into really authentic relationships to be in relationship with community in non-harmful ways. And then also, as Talia said, getting rid of those arbitrary silos, the silos between different sectors, the silos between SEL and restorative justice and even school climate and school safety, we all have to work together. And then lastly, that this work is messy. It's not easy, it's not quick, and it's a commitment to love and care for ourselves, for others every single day to what true transformation requires of all of us. And so with that, I say thank you so much to all of the panelists. I appreciate you. You dropped so much knowledge and wisdom today. And just, I'm, I'm so inspired by the work that you do. And then I even have the opportunity to be in this space with you and to learn from you. Thank you to all of the participants for showing up in this virtual space. We appreciate you and look forward to engaging with you further. As a quick note, uh, we will send out a resource sheet with all of the resources mentioned during this webinar. Uh, we'll also send out a recording of the webinar so you have access to that. Please do share widely. And then thank you so much to the interpreters, to Katja and Alexia for Spanish interpretation, leading us in language justice. And then also to Kathy and Amanda for ASL interpretation. We appreciate you being here so, so much. And then lastly, thanks so much to the CJSF squad for holding it down behind the scenes to make all of the tech come together. Please everyone join us for our next webinar as part of the hashtag reclaim SEL webinar series, mark your calendars for August 4th. <laughs> we'll see you same time, same place on Zoom, August 4th, 3.30 to 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Looking forward to engaging with you then. Thank you all so much, and we hope to see you soon.